the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So for the past several weeks, we've been celebrating creation. We've talked about the gift of light, of water, of the earth. Today, we reach another part of creation. You and I, made in the image of God, created by God, we celebrate each other. And as I thought about the people that have made the biggest difference in celebrating and preserving creation, they are people in full relationship with creation. People who love to surf, established wave riders, and became a, an advocate for the oceans and the wildlife therein. Fishermen were the first to notice and expose what we were doing to the Chesapeake Bay and fight to preserve it. Hikers saw what we were doing to our trees and our mountaintops and fought to keep those lands beautiful. And hunters who realized that their lands were being depleted and the hunt was getting thin through organizations like Ducks Unlimited have enabled preservation of tremendous lands. But how do we care for one another? Who are the people that do the same for us, for this part of creation, for you and me. I'm not sure I know, but I know that it requires us being as deeply in relationship with one another as we can be. I know that we live out of our baptismal covenant, and that calls us to be engaged with one another. Just the other week when we celebrated baptism, we all made promises to seek and serve Christ in everyone to respect the dignity of every human being, to be advocates, protectors, champions of one another. And I know we've fallen short. All of us have fallen short. I'm acutely aware of the ways that I've fallen short. And as a parent, I realize this, that when I disparage someone else, when I cast someone else down, my children pay attention. They realize when I say somebody else's opinion is invalid or I diminish them or I say something derogatory about them that I undercut the very tenet that I try to instill in them, that they are beloved children of God, that God made them in God's image, God made them exactly the way God wanted them to be, and they are worthy and lovable and wonderful. Because when I say something that undercuts that truth about someone else, when they really need to know that that truth is absolutely unwavering, it's not necessarily cemented in them. Because they hear. And whether you're raising children, you did make those promises when we stood up here and we promised those upon that baptized that we would do all in our power to help that child grow into that realization. That there was a truth in that scene where the skies opened up and the heavens broke down and said, this is my child, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. And when we say that's not true about one person, we say it's not true about anybody. Or at least we leave that open. And I've been acutely aware of the ways that we've done that recently. How short we've gotten in our listening. I realized this with my own daughter yesterday. We're standing on the sidelines, uh, and my daughter's just making small talk, and she tells me uh, that... Uh, the strings on her rebounder is broken. And I thought she meant this uh, thing that she purchased against my will. Uh, it's like a backboard, but you put your laundry in it. It's like a basketball hoop for your laundry. Uh, and it looked kind of flimsy, and I thought it was something she didn't know existed until she saw it on the shelves at the store. And she had to have it, and she just happened to have enough allowance to pay for it herself, uh, which sort of limited my ability to say no. Uh, so I thought that's what she was talking about. And as soon as she said it, I broke into this tirade. I told you not to buy it. I told you it was a bad idea. And she had this incredulous look, like, what are you talking about? Um, she was talking about the soccer goal I'd given her two Christmases ago uh, and how uh, it hadn't been working very well because the strings had gotten too stretched or broken. And, um, and then I had the opportunity, because she lives under my roof, uh, to apologize and to start over and to listen. We don't always have that. We don't always have that. One of the things that I'm uh, quite proud of, and we celebrate Episcopal Schools Week uh, on top of celebrating uh, creation this week, uh, is uh, the invitation that we received to go uh, to a conference of all of the new heads of school in the Episcopal Church uh, and talk to them about how a school and a church relate to one another. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, Stacey Irvin and I got to go and talk about something we're very proud of and that the church listened acutely uh, to the benefits and the needs of the school and the realities of the school. And the school listened acutely to the realities of the church. Uh, and over the last several years, we've built a relationship that is uh, incredibly solid. Uh, we understand and appreciate each other in ways uh, that, that few in that church school dynamic uh, do. But it took us putting on our glasses. In fact, that's one of the things we've talked about over the last month at the school as the virtue of the month is respect. Uh, that that calls us uh, to respect, to put on our glasses again, to put on and look at something with new eyes, to see again the way that God sees. And the director of the National Association of Episcopal Schools kind of reflected on that and reflected on a meeting he had the next day uh, in his weekly meditation that we received. Uh, and he talked about the biggest thing that he's coming across, uh, and it's uh, starting out in the national ethos uh, and making its way through the doors of the schools, uh, is that there is an incredible divisiveness. Uh, there is a caustic tension uh, that's making its way into the classroom. Uh, that schools are expressing the strife that is outside of the world, uh, affecting the way that they engage within the, the walls. Um, and he also described the fact that uh, as somebody uh, who came of age during the 60s, he has been riveted uh, by the Burns series on Vietnam. And he said there was one part of that series that struck him uh, right between the eyes. He said it was this interview with a Viet Cong soldier who describes uh, what it was like to be on the battlefield um, and, and to see uh, across enemy lines, as, as blurry as those lines might have been, uh, the suffering of American troops and the way that they cared for one another in that suffering. When a fallen soldier lost his life, the way that the fellow soldier next to him uh, had visible grief and palpable care and attention to their fallen brother. The way that an injured soldier was uh, cared for and never left behind. The look that you can see in someone's eyes when their hearts are breaking. And when he saw that, when he saw that humanity, that love that they had for one another, he understood that the enemy wasn't much different than himself. He said it reframed his entire understanding of what was going on. It didn't end the conflict but he could never look at the enemy the same again because he saw the way that he cared for his fellow brothers and nothing would ever be the same again. We're called to cross lines and we're called to love our enemy as ourselves. We're called to expand our understanding of neighbor. It's interesting when Jesus uh, is asked, what's the greatest rule of them all? What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? He tells us that, uh, that wonderful message that we need to love our neighbor as ourselves, Love God with all our heart, mind, and soul, and love our neighbor as ourselves. And the lawyer is thinking, okay, I just need to find out who the neighbor is, and then I can find out who's in and who's out and who I have to treat. Okay. And he tells the story of the Good Samaritan. And the way that Jesus tells it, it could have been anyone else in the world, and it would have been easier to digest. So think about who it would be in your own life. It could have been anyone else in the world, and it would be easier to digest this story than it would be for the Samaritan to be the good guy. And Randolph and I are the bad guys in the story. You didn't notice that, right? That's, uh, but he's challenging us to open our eyes a little wider and to see the people that we have the hardest time seeing as a true, beautiful, brilliant reflection of the image of God as our neighbor. And reflecting on this is we get ready to depart at the end of this month uh, for Haiti. And it's a trip I'm really excited about. And um, uh, a handful of us at the end of the month are going to Haiti. And we're not going there to fix anything. We're very committed to that. Uh, we're not bringing uh, American ingenuity or, or wealth or anything other than our eyes and our ears. Uh, we're going to explore what might be possible. One of our goals is to create a relationship between St. James Episcopal School uh, and a school there so that our children might grow up to understand uh, the image of God in a more diverse way, their neighbor in a more diverse way, what it is to grow up in an Episcopal school in a more interesting and diverse way. Uh, but we're going, uh, and I started to think about uh, 
what we might get out of this trip. I started thinking about my first real interest in Haiti. And it came before I was ordained. I was uh, visiting the Diocese of Kentucky that was going to sponsor me for seminary, and I was spending the summer there. Um, and uh, a real hero in that diocese, uh, Bishop Marmion, uh, was in his last year of life. He was uh, in his late 90s. Um, and uh, they were dedicating the, uh, the new pool at the camp to him. And, uh, and a lot of the stories about him were being told as, uh, as they knew that, the, that his time here was, was, was near, uh, nearing the end. Um, and there are some beautiful and powerful stories about, uh, about Bishop Marmion. Uh, Gresh Marmion uh, was a priest in, uh, in Texas, in a rural town in Texas in the 30s. And uh, one of the most... Um, profound experiences of his life is one that is a mixed uh, experience of sorrow, uh, of boldness, uh, but of fear, uh, and it framed a good bit of his ministry. Uh, in the 1930s, he found himself in a situation where, um, without any trial, uh, two young black men were being, uh, 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 they were about to be hung uh, for, for crimes that many of the people gathered around didn't really even think that they committed, uh, but group think, uh, and a riled up crowd got the best of people, uh, and they were going to hang these two men. And not one person spoke out. And so Gresh got on top of uh, the hood of a car and climbed up to the top of the car and yelled, stop, don't do this. You don't want to do this. And they say, we have three ropes. And he stood there frozen. He said he couldn't even remember any of the faces. He was so petrified. He said he felt like it was hopeless. And so he got off the car and he walked home. And he's never forgotten that moment and that moment galvanized his passion for justice and for the preservation and the wholeness and the dignity of every human being. And it became a hallmark of his ministry uh, to live out of that experience, uh, whether it was to redeem that experience or just galvanized uh, by the horror of that experience. That defined him. Uh, and when he was bishop of Kentucky, uh, uh, he was known far and wide for his passion for social justice, uh, and it extended to his relationship with Haiti. Uh, Haiti was their companion diocese, and not long after they'd established that relationship, uh, Papa Doc, the dictator who was in power in Haiti, removed the bishop, uh, uh, and uh, it, it became Marmion's job to go and to confirm, and supposedly he confirmed over 4,000 uh, Haitians uh, during his time as bishop, every year making an annual trip uh, to go and confirm those who wouldn't be confirmed because they had no bishop. Uh, and he didn't speak French, uh, but his wife Doris uh, phonetically uh, uh, printed the words uh, for confirmation on his stole, uh, which, uh, and then uh, uh, clipped them upside down on his stole so that he could put both hands on each person that he confirmed and read those words of confirmation upside down uh, or right side up for him uh, as he confirmed thousands. Uh, and a relationship that he sparked from his uh, desire for justice in Texas uh, was with a former bishop of Texas who became the presiding bishop during the Civil Rights Movement, uh, a real hero in our church, John Hines. And John Hines uh, knew the delicate situation in Haiti, and he also knew uh, the incredible strength and courage uh, of this uh, Bishop Marmion. So uh, he sent Marmion to Haiti uh, to oversee the election of a bishop. And Papa Doc had his bishop choice that he'd handpicked, uh, and he figured out how to uh, uh, coerce the election. So they're in the cathedral, and uh, Bishop Marmion is there, and uh, there's, there's other candidates, uh, and then there's Papa Doc's candidate, and the a cathedral is lined with soldiers with machine guns. And Marmion stopped everything. And he said, this is the Lord's house. And this is the Lord's election. This election will be determined by the spirit of God working through his people. There will be no machine guns, and we won't hold this election until all of the soldiers leave. And there was silence until they all left. And a true democratic election was held. And Papa Doc's candidate didn't get elected. And then he committed to staying there in relationship with Haiti as they tried to heal from all the damage that had been done. Uh, and then that diocese uh, that was affected by his experience in, in the 1930s in Texas, uh, uh, translated into his time in Haiti, affected the diocese and its worldview and its commitment not just to Haiti, but to the needs and concerns of the local community. So it's my prayer that sometimes it's hard to see what's right in front of us. 
sometimes it's hard to see past the divides and the differences uh, that are in our own household, that are in our own neighborhood, that are in our own community, that maybe we can go uh, to a place far away with people whose lives are much different than us. And we can come back with fresh eyes to see each other a little differently, to truly respect the dignity of every human being, to be the people that we promise to be to our children, to help them to see that divine image, that wonderful reflection in each person. Amen.